And yet, despite how epic these songs are on the outside, there is still an internal loneliness to all of it. Released in August of 1994, Grace was the only album released by Jeff Buckley during his lifetime. The album garnered poor sales and mixed reviews upon release. But 10 years later, in 2004, the album would receive enough critical acclaim to warrant a two-CD anniversary reissue. Jimmy Page considered Grace close to being his favorite album of the decade. Bob Dylan named Buckley one of the greatest songwriters of that decade. David Bowie considered Grace to be the best album ever made and had said it would be amongst his 10 Desert Island Records. And while so many legendary artists have sung the album's praises, I find still that 20 years later, as this video is being made, that most rock and pop music fans in general still don't know who Jeff Buckley was and have never heard his one and only album, Grace. It's free with the but here's the rub. Oftentimes, the very same people who tell me that they don't know who Jeff Buckley is will, more likely than not, respond and say, wait, I've heard this before, after I play his cover of Alleluia by Leonard Cohen. Well, I heard there was a secret chord. I'm serious. If you're a fan of the album and you know someone who says they've never heard of either Jeff Buckley or his album Grace, play his cover of Alleluia and see how they respond. Because as much as I respect Leonard Cohen for originally writing and recording Alleluia, I believe it is Jeff Buckley's cover that really catapulted the song into the mainstream. It should be noted that John Cale recorded the first cover in 1990, and Buckley said that he was inspired by Kill's recording, but I believe that it is Buckley's cover that most artists modeled their renditions off of moving forward. And this is why listeners who say they have never heard of Buckley or his album react in the way that they do when you play Alleluia for them. And this is because they've either heard his version or a version someone else recorded who was inspired by Buckley's cover. To put it another way, in the same way that Aretha Franklin's cover of Respect is considered the definitive version, so is Jeff Buckley's cover of Alleluia. But I digress. Grace is more than just this one song. It is so much more. When discussing his 10 albums he cannot live without, Sammy Hagar described Grace as one of the greatest, most complete albums ever made. Listening to the whole thing is so emotional, and it never fails to get under my skin. It still gives me goosebumps, chokes me up, and inspires me to go deeper as an artist. It's one of the loneliest records. It's most powerful listened to alone with headphones. I often think about what he would have created if he'd stuck around a little longer. And that last line is what so many critics and fans ponder whenever they think about him as well, including myself. Because like Vincent Van Gogh, Jeff Buckley never lived to see this album reach the level of acclaimed status that it now has. Jeff Buckley was the biological son of singer-songwriter Tim Buckley, who died in 1975 from a drug overdose. In interviews, it becomes apparent that his biological father had little to no influence on his life, as Jeff Buckley claims to have only met him once in his lifetime. This would have been at the age of eight, several months before his death. Jeff Buckley was close to his mother, who was a classical pianist, and his stepfather, who introduced him to Led Zeppelin by way of the album Physical Graffiti. Led Zeppelin would be a band that Buckley would regard as one of his biggest musical influences right alongside musicians and bands like Queen, The Who, Jimi Hendrix, Kiss, and Pink Floyd. 
prior to recording Grace, he would spend a number of years playing guitar for various struggling bands, ranging in styles from jazz, reggae, roots rock, and heavy metal. Ironically, though, it was an invitation to sing at a tribute concert for his biological father that would first get him noticed by the music industry at large. And while Buckley was not quick to sign with whoever offered him a record deal first, he did eventually sign to Columbia Records. The album would only peak as high as number 149 on the Billboard charts initially, and was largely ignored by the public, even though it did receive early praise from famous musicians like the ones I mentioned earlier. I can remember actually seeing the album's cover before I ever heard a single note from the album or knowing anything about Jeff Buckley himself and what his music sounded like. Looking at the cover, I kind of expected a baritone singer performing pop rock music in the style of 80s groups like Duran Duran and Depeche Mode. Later, however, and much to my chagrin, I would find out that his record company actually felt the same way about the cover too, and even cautioned him against using it. But listening to the album, it was clear that his music wasn't anything like what the album cover might have implied. Now, if I were to describe the music on Grace verbally, I would call it a cross between 60s psychedelic folk music, U2, and of course, his biggest influence, Led Zeppelin. The album's opening track, Mojo Pin, is a good example. This song opens with some swirling guitar arpeggios and harmonics that are very reminiscent of U2's The Edge. The song, however, builds into this driving guitar-driven crescendo that is very reminiscent of Led Zeppelin. Buckley's lyrics and phrasings echo Bono during U2's Joshua Tree and Unforgettable Fire period, except that Buckley's voice is higher and more in the range of Robert Plant. The song is filled with a sense of danger and mysticism and what Jimmy Page used to refer to as light and shadow. It's also soulful, spiritual, as its lyrics tell a tale of love and obsession. Or is it possession? It's hard to say. And this is just the first song. From front to back, the album is filled with songs that are more than just pop songs. It is filled with songs that explore existential states of being across musical hills and valleys that will run on forever in your mind, long after it is finished. And yet, despite how epic these songs are on the outside, there is still an internal loneliness to all of it. I agree with Sammy Hagar's assessment that Grace is not an album that you blast on the stereo when you're out with your best buddies, but that it is best experienced in solitude. Grace was released as the 90s were coming into their own. That same year, Oasis released their debut, Definitely Maybe. It was the same year that Green Day released their breakthrough album, Dookie, and also when Beck released his breakthrough, Mellow Gold. It was also the year STP released Purple, and the year that Allison Chains released Jar of Flies. Jeff Buckley could have been one of the 90s greatest artists, had it all not sadly come to an end. This is our last goodbye. On May 29, 1997, Jeff Buckley died in a tragic drowning accident. I won't get into all of the details here. There's plenty of places online where you can read about it. But what I will say is that none of the usual vices of rock stardom, drugs and alcohol, played any part in any of it. It was simply a tragic accident. In 1998, one year after his death, his unfinished second album, 
My Sweetheart the Drunk, would be released under the revised title of Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk. It is a compilation album of mixes, demos, and work-in-progress tracks for what would have been his second studio album. 2013 saw the re-release of his original four-song pre-grace EP, Live at Cine, now expanded into a two-CD, one-DVD edition. I guess it's no longer an EP anymore, but a full-length live album of him playing at the Café Cine prior to signing to Columbia Records. By the way, I hope I got that cafe name right. If I didn't, I apologize. Also released posthumously was You and I, a 2016 uh, collection of early demos. And on the hype sticker for that release, Jimmy Page is quoted as saying, undeniably, this early work provides us with a glimpse of a musical genius at work. Now, because of all the copyright bots that populate YouTube, uh, it's very hard for me to really post any audio clips of any real substance or consequence here. And if you know the album, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't know the album, go listen now. This is TJR. Have you heard this album? If so, please leave your thoughts. Has this video made you curious and are you planning on checking it out? After you have, again, please leave a comment. I want to thank my patron supporters. Patron supporters do receive exclusive weekly videos not available on this channel. If you'd like to be a patron supporter, please go to patreon.com forward slash TJR, the original. And if you can't, you can always leave a one-time super thanks, or you can just click like. Mostly, I just want to thank you for stopping by, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.